It's been 10 days since the Russian military's big offensive towards Pokrovsk has gotten them, well, any closer to Pokrovsk. But is the Kremlin going into full-on cope mode? And just how do we know that this is shaping up to be a disaster for Vladimir Putin? I'm Paul, U.S. Army combat veteran. Let's talk about this interesting story. Okay, so let's take a look here at Pokrovsk. We know that Again, one of the things I've talked about throughout this conflict is when you have these wars of attrition, a lot of people handering over key towns and key terrain. The answer is there's actually not that much key terrain in the aggregate. You may recall that during the Battle of Bakhmut, people were like, the, oh, the Bakhmut falls. Well, Bakhmut did fall. And what happened? Yes, the Russian military advanced approximately, ooh, an additional... To, let's see, an additional uh, six, seven kilometers outside of Bachman, right? In the two years since the fall of Bachman. So the, people were like, oh, the Bachman's significant. Oh, and Pokrovsk is the same story, right? This is significant as a logistics hub for supplying the front line east of Pokrovsk. Obviously, if Pokrovsk falls, then simply another town will assume the role of the logistics hub. And because this is a war of attrition, right, there's not a lot of these, any town can become significant based on sort of the slow moving front line. I say this because Pokrovsk, a lot of people have started hand wringing about it. And no one has become more fixated on it than Vladimir Putin himself. Purportedly, he ordered the Russian military by September to defend, their, to seize this town from Ukrainian defenders. And Frankly, it seemed for a long time, like the better part of like six months, that that was the Russian effort. In fact, let's see if we can actually, uh, is, this calendar can sometimes be a little buggy, but let's actually go six months back in time to February 2022, and you can see that six months of progress by the Russian military uh, has gotten them indeed truly somewhat closer to Pokrovsk, right? He'd take us to the sixth. And you can see they've made this, uh, I guess we'll call it a considerable advance uh, of about 28 kilometers. But here's the thing. It seems to have finally run out of steam. And why do I say that? Well, let's take it back to the 28th. Now, what I want you to zoom in here is the part where Russia actually gets closer to the town of Pokrovsk, right? So right now, here we are, the 28th, the closest point of the Russian military to Pokrovsk, 10.62 kilometers. Now, you can see, oh, they make, sorry, they make a little smidge of an advance the next day, meaning that from we're going to say downtown Pokrovsk, or actually we'll use the edge. We'll use the edge of Pokrovsk right here where it seems to transition from this tiny suburb of Natkivka. It's got 8.79 kilometers. Now, that was as of the 28th of August. Now let's fast forward to today. You can see Russian forces are making some creeping advances, and certainly they're advancing uh, to the south, but that's not what Putin ordered them to take. Putin's orders were take Pokrovsk. And you can see here, again, same point, and the same closest point is exactly 8.82 kilometers. So the Russian military in 10 days has gone absolutely nowhere. And you and I know why. What happened in this intervening uh 10 days, the answer is, of course, Russia had to divert up to 30,000 of its combat troops to Kursk to contain Ukraine's Kursk offensive. And while the Ukrainians continue to make some limited progress, they've really been focused primarily on digging in and making sure the Russians cannot dislodge them from this from their Russian territory, right? This is probably their most important bargaining chip uh, when it comes time to sit down at the negotiating table. But how do I really know that Russian forces are giving up on Pokrovsk? Well, the answer, we're going to talk to you in a second. But if you want to see some of the fighting from this region, and especially some of the new tools that Ukrainians have rolled out to the battlefield in order to stop this Russian advance, particularly advanced drones, unlike anything even the U.S. military has in its arsenal, uh... Those videos I can't show you because they're combat videos and YouTube won't let me show them anymore. So they are on combatvetnews.com. You may have also noticed that a lot of YouTubers uh, that talk about the news and current events uh, were recently busted by having taking huge amounts of money from the Kremlin. I don't take money from anyone. Uh, but the reason 
is because I'm supported by the viewers on Combat Vet News. I own the site. I host it. No one has leverage over me. And I give you guys twice a week uncensored combat videos, a weekly Q&A, shout outs at the end of videos, recognition. So if you want to support me and keep me as one of the independent voices who's not beholden to anybody, check us out, combatvetnews.com and become a member. Get your shout outs, get your exclusive videos, get all the good stuff. Um, and again, support me in being able to stay independent, right? Not that I would ever sell out to a government. I worked for the U.S. government for seven years. I don't need to, uh, longer, actually. Five years in the military and then another seven with DHS. So what's that, 12 years in the U.S. government? Yeah, I don't need to work for them anymore. I don't need to work for anybody. All right. How do we know? Well, the answer is, of course, the media. Now, you can see here the most uh, fairly legitimate media outlets. And again, the Kiev Independent, pretty pro-Ukrainian. But I've seen the same article basically on CNN and Reuters, uh, right? And according to data from Ukraine's own uh, people as well as independent analysts, uh, the Russian advance in Prokovsk, as we just talked about, uh, is really sort of ground to a halt, Right. Institute for the Study of War co uh, uh, corresponding this, saying, yeah, there's been no geolocated footage of Russian forces actually moving towards Pokrovsk in the last uh, 10 days or so. CNN, of course, said the same thing. So this is fairly legitimate. Uh, now, what else do we know? We could see that when you Google it, there are some interesting hits. Eurasian Daily has spun this. She says Zelensky has demanded that Sirsky hold Pokrovsk at any cost. Quote insider. Okay, this is doing a lot of heavy lifting here because, again, you notice they're referring it as the Kiev regime, uh, as ordered Sirsky to, uh, ordered Sirsky to hold Pokorovsk at any cost. This is uh, from a Ukrainian Telegram quote resident, which in turn cited an informed source in the office of the president. Uh, right? And he says, uh, there's a bunch of weird phrasing here. For, it's essential for the political leadership of the regime to form an opinion on stabilization of the Eastern Front, which will not allow the defeat of an entire group of the Ukrainian armed forces in Donbass, which is not the same thing as losing Pokrovsk. Uh, yeah. So you may be like, this is, this sounds like an idiot wrote it. And it turns out an idiot did write it because it's pure cope. Eurasian Daily, or EA Daily, is a Russian pro-Kremlin news outlet founded in 2015 that publishes false and inaccurate information, citing absolutely nothing. Uh, of course, we know that. Uh, even Radio Liberty, as long as five or six years ago, was saying, or sorry, more than five years ago, like seven years ago, long, was uh, described Eurasian Daily as long known for its pro-Kremlin orientation. But this is actually useful for us because it tells us when the Russian cope machine is turned on. And we know that the Russian cope machine only really gets spun up when the actual Russian war machine is faltering. And the fact that they're already spinning the fact that this is somehow some sort of big tactical uh, uh, boondoggle, you know, is itself it sounds like pure cope because we know Sirsky when he took over he said listen I have a different perspective Sirsky's policy has been nothing 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 is worth sacrificing whole Ukrainian brigades right uh, and as I point out that the actual battlefield significance of some of these regions is not that great Pokrovsk there is nothing special about it relative to other villages of the same size right Yes, I get it. It has the, It's at the intersection of two roadways, but those roadways are only significant in that they feed other Ukrainian areas of the front. So I say this because Zelensky is unlikely to have said this. Uh, and again, they're citing a source which is citing an, anon an anonymous telegram, citing an anonymous official uh, is highly uncredible. And so instead, and again, it would reflect a complete 180 degree pivot from Sierski's policy up until this point, which has been, there is no land that can, there is nothing in the front line that is worth losing Ukrainian lives, right? Or losing tremendous, disproportionate Ukrainian lives. No more, no more Bakhmits, no more unfallable uh, terrain, no more pointless fighting in Avdivka. Uh, and this has been effective, right? Russian forces being killed pretty much in mass. And this strategy has freed up those Ukrainian brigades to for the Kursk operation. So frankly, 
uh, uh, Zelensky is, is almost certainly unlikely uh, to be sitting there and, you know, pissed at Sirsky for giving him literally everything he wanted and taking the fight to Putin, right? So that conversation probably just made up entirely uh, by the Kremlin, who, of course, needs to invent things to explain the fact that though Putin's number one objective, something that he frankly publicly has acknowledged is his number one Russian military priority. He's gone out and answer, answered questions, real authentic questions from the Russian public in some of these roundtables where they've expressed concern over the fact that Ukrainians are holding Kursk. And Putin has said, listen, it's not great that the Ukrainians own Russian territory, sure, but our priority is to continue to advance in the Donbass. And that's not happening either. That's just a small... Tiny little problem for Putin, who, again, when you're not, when you are not democratic, you are stuck being an authoritarian. And authoritarians have exactly one thing that they claim to do better than any of those pesky elected officials in other countries. And that is be strong, right? Democracy is messy. There's a lot of debates. It is a lot of hand wringing and it is a lot of compromise. And there's one thing, when you're tired of compromise, a strong man comes in and says, guess what? I'll never compromise. I will make you as strong as you want to be. But that comes on, that's a double-sided coin. Because the other side of that coin is that when you look weak, people ask themselves a really uncomfortable question for an autocrat. People ask, well, if you're weak, and I also don't have freedom of speech, freedom of press, freedom of assembly, in the case of many of these Russian soldiers, I don't even have life. I'm literally being forced to fight again and again. Russia, Russia commits war crimes against Ukrainians all the time, but they also commit war crimes against their own people with an equal frequency. And so you say, Lizzo, well, why am I subject to all these brutalities for a weak regime that's getting its ass kicked by a bunch of supposedly weak democracies? And so for Putin, the need to explain the fact that they're failing in Donbass and failing to protect Russia's own borders is a massive humiliation. And that's why you're seeing this cope machine roll out. Because I want to point out that this has been translated by Google, but the original is Russian. This is a Russian news outlet. It's not for, it's not written for you and I. It's written for the Russian public. Look at, the, look at some of those dumb faces. It's not an accident, guys. It means that the Kremlin is resorting to cope. Anyway, guys, that's all I had. Please subscribe to the channel. That really makes a difference for me. As well, thank you to the Colonel Tier members, James Gerling, Steve Moran, Doug Beck, Allen, Nutt, Sebastian Hemmerling, Yanko, Georgiev, Dale McCombs, James Ola. Your guys' support means the world to me and enables me to continue to do this uh, and not have to take, uh, you know, Kremlin money. I've had I, I've had other governments reach out. I've had, I'll say that. Um, and I've told them to pound sand, which is what you can do. Anyway, because I got you guys on my back. Thanks. See you in the next one. Cheers.